I just put a comment in the chat box and I did it uh, in the question section rather, and I did it um, while Tom Inglesby was speaking. And it just continues to strike me for the past long number of years that I've been working in pandemic preparedness, that people working in the public health sector have a tendency to see preparedness through the eyes of the public health experts that they are, but talk about engaging with the community and learning what their priorities are and so on and so, so forth without necessarily realizing that community priorities are not necessarily restricted to the public health sector, even during the course of a pandemic. So there's been mentioned during this session, for example, of um, people needing to earn a living, yet there are many who say, no, we need to lock down communities and close down businesses and so on and so forth. There are parents who, whose primary concern is the schooling of their children. Yet we make very, very little investment and certainly none out of health funding to finding out how that education can continue even when schools may be places of high transmission of communicable diseases. So I, I just tried to sum things up in my comment by saying that everything that's been said about the need for increased funding to the public health sector, all of the advances that are made and they are not yet enough in virology and virological diagnosis and vaccine development and dissemination and so on and so forth are absolutely critical. They are necessary, yet they are not sufficient. And I wish that public health experts would also take the time to see that they need to be leaders beyond the boundaries of the public health sector alone. That if we're going to talk seriously about community engagement, we need to really be serious about listening to what all sectors of the community are telling us are their priorities. And I don't want to belabor the point or go on. I will because Dorothy just spoke about USAID's achievements. I would say that USAID during the first decade of this century had made substantial investments in the preparedness efforts when people were very afraid of H5N1 of an H5N1 influenza pandemic occurring, USAID was in the forefront of pushing the whole of society approach to pandemic preparedness. And we really have seemed to have lost that concept, that notion from what needs to be done. Um, I think I'm not in the US as David mentioned, but I think every one of you who is in Washington and following what's happening in the US realizes that people were up in arms about education. People were up in arms about employment. People were up in arms about policing and civil defense priorities. And, and you know, there are so many aspects to pandemic preparedness. Yes, preparing to respond. I'm not talking about preparing to prevent. If we can reach a point where the public health efforts can prevent pandemics from occurring in the first place, that would be fantastic. Personally, I don't see that happening. And we learn over and over and over again that there are three to four pandemics each century since the 15th century. So anyway, I, I don't need to belabor the point. And I just thank you, David, for giving me the floor. I wasn't expecting it. I think it's been a great session. I agree with absolutely everything that's been said but I firmly believe and I'm committed to advocating for expansion beyond the boundaries of the public health sector so that if an event like COVID, like Ebola, like monkeypox occurs again, I shouldn't say if, I should say when, that we can have a much, much greater, higher level of preparedness throughout the whole of society. 